So thanks uh, everyone for joining us, uh, panelists and anyone uh, who might be watching. My name is Matt Baker. I'm the managing editor here at RE Journals. I oversee the Illinois Real Estate Journal, Chicago Industrial Properties, and now Red News in Texas. Um, I wanna thank uh, our, my team here in Chicago for helping us pivot from this normally huge multi-hundred people attending one you know, hotel downtown into a uh, digital experience. And you know, couldn't have done that without Ernie Abood, John Mickey, Mary Ann Gerson, uh, Alyssa Galinsky, Mark Menzies, and, and several others behind the scenes uh, helping to make that happen. Um, I wanna make sure that uh, everyone has a chance to go and look at our sponsors, uh, make, making that pivot to a digital experience uh, mm -hmm. would not have been possible without their underwriting. So uh, we uh, really uh, appreciate that. Um, we, you know, we are due to end at 1.30. I'm not sure about that. Uh, but, you know, this is the last session. So, you know, you know, no reason to rush. Um, and uh, with that, I'm going to get off. Like, as I said, everyone's time is precious and I want to get you guys uh, going. So I'm going to pass it over to our uh, moderator, Ralph DePasquale, Managing Director of Bricadia. And uh, I'm looking forward to hear what everyone has to say. Great. Thank you. And uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is a little bit new for all of us, although it, it seems like it's getting to be old hat. We've done it uh, a few times now with a, a digital format. Uh, it's still a little bit weird to get used to, but um, hopefully we'll all be together soon uh, or together soon again. Um, I'm going to let, uh, it, uh, as uh, our, uh, um, our, let our panel actually just introduce themselves rather than me going through it but um and i'll just go in order of what i see on my screen here but uh michael why don't you uh give us a, a minute on yourself and and uh what you cover and and then we'll go into some questions fantastic well thank you ralph thank you everybody for attending uh my name is michael hayford i am the regional director for the uh, uh multi-family uh, market here for castle systems um, if you're unfamiliar with Castle, we are a hosted managed security technology firm uh, where we specialize in access control technologies and uh, video surveillance technologies uh, for both the commercial real estate office as well as multifamily uh, arenas. Um, I'm personally responsible for the multifamily side, which is why I'm here with you today. And uh, I look forward to sharing with you all some of the forecasted technologies and the future of what security technologies looks like. So thank you, Ralph. Thank you. Vicki? Hi, I'm Vicki Arroyo and I am um, an executive vice president at Bank Financial, a Chicagoland um, owned bank that's been around since 1924. I um, manage the commercial real estate division for the bank, um, for the Chicagoland market. Uh, and um, that's primarily made up of multifamily um, transactions. The bank has about $525 million in um, a uh, multifamily portfolio, and that's spread across five different states. So we also have a national presence in Texas, um, Colorado, Florida, South Carolina, and um, who, did, who did I miss? I think that's, I think I covered all of them. Um, but we've been, you know, really multifamily lending is our bread and butter. And we um, we primarily do portfolio products of loans up to $20 million, but also have a capital markets network. So we can um, shop deals for our clients as well through that network and um, try to offer both products, whatever fits best for them. Great, thanks Vicki and um, John. Yeah, thanks Ralph um, and thanks real estate. Um, journals and, and everyone on, on uh, the call. Uh, John Prisbilla with Horvath and Tremblay. We're a commercial real estate brokerage firm, obviously specializing in representing owners and, and buyers, investors uh, here in Chicago. Uh, main focus is multifamily and uh, also retail properties. Um, locally, uh, here in the MSA, Northwest Indiana, uh, we have offices uh, in Chicago, uh, licensing in Northwest Indiana. We have an office uh, in Boston. New Jersey and Miami, Florida, uh, also uh, heavily uh, involved uh, with 1031 exchanges. We have a trading desk of agents to help uh, a lot of our clients um, facilitate the 1031 exchange. So uh, happy to be here. Well, thanks, John. And uh, finally, Josh. 
Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Josh Hanna. I'm a partner in the real estate practice at Kirkland & Ellis. Uh, Kirkland is the world's largest law firm. Uh, globally, we have over 2,500 lawyers, including around 700 here in Chicago, uh, where we are headquartered. About 100 of us focused exclusively on real estate. Uh, my practice is mainly uh, dedicated to joint ventures, purchase and sales, uh, financing, and uh, across the asset classes, but primarily multifamily and industrial um, office and, and representing private equity clients, institutional investors, uh, foreign investors and, um, and developers. Yeah, all right, thanks. Thanks, Josh. Um, as I think we have about uh, 50 or so on, on the call, it looks like, uh, participants. So. I thought there might be a way to, to be able to chat if you had questions, but it doesn't look like there might be. But if you if you uh, send a chat in uh, via question, we'll try to get it answered. But we do have just some things, obviously, we're, we're going to touch on. We have a pretty uh, diverse panel here. So we're going to cover a lot of, uh, hopefully, a number of topics. Um, and it's a forecast, obviously. So we're going to hopefully share our at least our thoughts on on some of the things that are that we're seeing and probably uh, anticipating seeing in the coming year. Um, I'll just start off by saying, obviously, uh, 2020 was a uh, memorable, I guess, <laughs> year. Uh, uh, hopefully, everybody's looking forward to a, a better 2021 from a lot of different perspectives. Uh, um, you know, every every day you turn the TV on and it seems like there's something uh, something new that you never thought you would see uh, happening. But um, that being the case, obviously, uh, COVID has impacted so many things in our lives over the last year, um, and multifamily, not the least of which, but um, from that perspective. I, so I, I'll start off by just uh, saying that, um, you know, the city, the city itself has seen a, a dramatic shift in, in multifamily demand over the last year. Uh, with COVID-19. I mean, vacancy rates are probably at 20-year highs. Um, and on the other hand, suburbs have held fairly steady and done done well. Um, I guess I'll put it to the panel going forward. Uh, we, we know what's transpired, but do you see this as a temporary phenomenon or, or a more, more permanent paradigm shift uh, going forward? Um, and Converse, uh, along with that, how, how do you think that's going to impact financing of available new projects, uh, financing for value add deals? Just uh, I'll open it up to the panel and whoever wants to take that first. I can take that first. Um, I, I think that the um, vacancies, you know, have gone up and, you know, but, you know, when you look, especially because we look at properties and transactions nationally, um, you know, some markets have a 3% vacancy, some markets have a 14% vacancy. So we're kind of across the spectrum and, and you know, we're affected in various ways. But I do think that um, right now for 2021 anyway, I would think that, um, you know, we actually expected vacancy rates to be a lot more drastic in 2020 during the COVID um, and, you know, every all the unknown of what was gonna happen with the economy. And um, I think that right now, what we're anticipating is that um, the shoe, you know, hasn't fallen yet necessarily. So there could still be a dip somewhere along the line. I think things change daily. So, you know, there's more stimulus in the market. You know, we have a little bit more stimulus now. We didn't have that a month ago. Um, there's more to come down the line. So there, I think the uncertainty is still gonna be there for banks to really, you know, proceed with caution. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, the activities there, there's still good deals in the marketplace. Um, vacancy rates aren't scaring us away. And, um, you know, we're, we're being optimistic um, that everybody's really, you know, kind of all hands on deck currently and, you know, across all industries to try to, you know, make sure that multifamily, the multifamily sector stays strong. So we're, we're optimistic about it. Um, we think that, you know, urban markets are, are the ones that are being affected the most and will continue in 2021. Um, because people, you know, used to live close to, you know, close to work because that's where, you know, to avoid their commute. So now they have more options. So I, I anticipate that, you know, the vacancies in the urban markets will continue to, you know, be higher than in other, you know, suburban markets. John, are you, are you seeing that in the uh, suburban versus urban 
investment market or uh, what are you seeing on that front? Yeah, yeah. So it, I kind of we kind of look at it uh, and have seen it in a couple of different ways. But from the migration from the city to the suburbs, we're, we're kind of looking at why. And from a tenant standpoint or, or a homeowner standpoint, uh, there's certain things. Safety comes to mind, um, you know, with with the city to the suburbs. Uh, health, uh, the density of the city being around people with this disease. But you could argue now that the city isn't as dense. Uh, but regardless, a lot of people in the city. Um, affordability. Uh, from the, the city to the suburbs. Um, I know it's been talked about for years with our clients, uh, but even homeowners, real estate taxes, um, you know, the difference of Cook County to other counties. Um, and then just taxes uh, economically, or, you know, whether it's sales taxes, that, that pressure, and just that feeling of uh, it's different in the city um, or it's normal in the suburbs. Um, and it's not only for the, the tenants and homeowners, but yes, Ralph, uh, our investors. Um, earlier, uh, Dr. Doutzer talked about uh, primary markets and looking at secondary markets like St. Louis or Kansas City. And, and in the MSA, we look at Chicago as the primary market. And you look at the suburbs, you could, you could argue as a secondary market. And, and they're attractive to our investors. And it's a, there, there's a difference in cap rates. Um, there's a difference in the returns. Um, running a property in terms of the expense load. Um, you could argue that that things are, are more affordable or, or, or at a better price uh, in the suburbs. Northwest Indiana, um, great, great market. Uh, we do a lot of business in Northwest Indiana. A lot of uh, people will live there, but our investors are also investing there just because of, of somewhat the ease of getting to Northwest Indiana from the Chicago mm -hmm. market. Uh, there's tremendous rent growth. Uh, not only in Northwest Indiana, but real estate tax is different in, in Indiana versus Illinois. Um, so yes, we, we are seeing that, uh, that, that shift, not only in people leaving the city, but investors. But I will say this, Ralph, uh, there's still a strong belief in the city from, from a lot of investors. Mm -hmm. okay? And I'm one of them. Uh, I believe in the city. I believe it, it will be there. Um, but with some of our investors, the belief is, hey, it's now. Uh, let's get into the market now. Others are land banking or, or, or buying in the market now uh, and then waiting for, for the future. But there, there still is uh, a lot of uh, uh, bullishness in, in the city from, from our investors, but definitely seeing uh, across all product types. Yeah, we're, we're seeing a lot of that too. And I, I didn't introduce myself at the beginning, but I, and I should have. Uh, I, I'm in the investment sales side as well for Bricadia, uh, obviously. Um, we're, we do quite a bit of business in the Chicago market, but also in Wisconsin. Uh, and we're seeing quite a bit, uh, you know, just north of the border as well. But um, the, um, you know, obviously COVID's had, had a tremendous impact on occupancies, but, um, you know, maybe Michael, can you, can you possibly address some of the things that are, from a technology standpoint that we're seeing that are different uh, say this year versus last year or the last couple of years that, sure. you know, how landlords and maybe have adapted to some of these things. Sure, absolutely. So, so the, the, the key word there, Ralph, is, is occupancy. And that's really in our wheelhouse, right? So uh, being an access control security company, uh, that's something that we keep track of, um, you know, quite, quite, a, you know, quite finally is kind of what are the occupancies of both our office uh, tenants, as well as our multifamily, you know, residential uh, units. And what we're seeing, which should be no surprise to anyone, is, is certainly on the multifamily side, we're seeing the occupancy rates as far as people being uh, occupying their condos or their apartments uh, at a much greater frequency than, than prior to COVID with everyone obviously working remote. So the, the challenge from a, from a security standpoint is how do we uh, take what traditionally had been maybe a 30% a occupancy during the day to a 90 to 100% occupancy during the day and make that a 24 hour uh, operation. So, um, you know, what we've been able to do through technologies is, you know, come up with ways um, that we're able to better keep line of sight on properties um, and, and uh, really pin it to really four things. And, you know, one of those kind of most, one of the most exciting pieces of technology that I personally, uh, you know, like to share is uh, what we call a remote guarding uh, technology. And essentially what it does 
it's both for you know your suburban garden style properties as well as your urban high rise properties where what it does is it alleviates some of the stress and tension from operations and maybe physical security or uh, you know, uh, you know, doorman staff, doorman staff having to keep a line of sight as to safety and security mm -hmm. that's going on throughout the property, where we're able to, you know, install uh, artificial intelligence based systems that will look for specific, op, you know, activity throughout a property. Um, as a brief example, you know, if you have a garden style community and there is a group of five or more people congregating in one area, you know, those cameras will focus on those five people. And if anything nefarious happens, if there's, you know, a, an assault, a battery, a shooting, anything, what, what that technology will do is as that, that crowd disperses, each person will be grabbed by a camera and those cameras throughout the property will follow each of those five people to figure out where they went in the property. So that property management wow. does a better job of saying, okay, Ralph, I know you were there. John, I know you were there. Vicki, I knew you were there. And I know where you all went and what units you're in. So it's, it's an ability to put a finer line of sight onto activity to make sure that, that we're, we're, we're providing more of a safe, secure environment. The other thing that's really interesting is, is you know, this drive, this drive from COVID um, being kind of touchless uh, entries. And, you know, nobody wants to grab door handles, nobody wants to push elevator buttons. So how are we able to go and, and offer this hands-free technology uh, around access control? And there's a lot of opportunity out there uh, when you look at things like digital credentials as opposed to having a key fob. Um, the ability for Bluetooth communication between your smartphone and an access control fob reader um, or an, and an elevator to where I approach the elevator and it automatically knows by my credential. I live on the 25th floor. It automatically calls that car. And as I you know, step into the elevator, it takes me right to my, right to my floor. So there's a lot of really you know, interesting uh, technology opportunities that, that you know, uh, have been birthed from this, you know, this, this uh, coronavirus. Um, and we're continuing to see these technologies, you know, mature um, far into, you know, 2021. Um, I'm really excited to see how that matures. So um, those are really kind of the two biggest things from safety and security is how to keep a better line of sight through, you know, better camera systems, artificial intelligent camera systems, and then really hands-free technologies to, uh, to mitigate people touching uh, the same surfaces. No, that's, yeah, that's great. And, and of course, uh, there's a lot of properties that have, that have gone to sort of a virtual, virtual touring, virtual leasing. Uh, a lot of those kinds of activities took place uh, last year, a lot more so than uh, they, they were sort of starting to go in that direction in some cases, a lot of internet leasing and things like that. But uh, obviously, it, it amplified it last year a little bit more. But um, you know, one of the one of the things that was that, that came out of last spring uh, it seems like forever ago now, but uh, but uh, still very current as well. Um, you know, people were always uh, investors, uh, owners of properties, were uh, skittish in, about how are people going to be able to pay their rent. Uh, going forward, you know, things like that, what's going to happen. And, uh, you know, there was a number of things that were put in place, moratoriums and, and, and legal aspects from, from that, uh, um, you know, from the COVID, obviously. Uh, people started paying their rents, but there's still a lot of moratoriums still in place. But uh, Josh, I don't know, maybe you can address some of the, some of the legal aspects of, of COVID-19 and what, what you've seen over the last year. Uh, with some of that, um, you know, either tenant rights or, or landlord moratoriums, things like that. I think I, it's it's certainly been a fascinating um, experience to to observe from the legal standpoint. Just like uh, all of you in in the business, um, you know, I think we were when it first shut down. Everyone is wondering, okay, okay what's what happens next? Is is literally everyone going to stop paying rent? Uh, what happens with the mortgage? How is how are the parties going to work through this when it's really nobody's uh, fault? Uh, is there going to be giant government stimulus coming to uh, you know to help everybody involved? Um, is it going to favor tenants, favor landlords? 
I, I think what we've seen um, is, is as, as you mentioned, the moratoriums on evictions. And there's been, you know, I think, mild, um, mild relief in favor of landlords. But you know, generally speaking, um, you know, the, the thrust of the uh, of the regulations has been to protect tenants, uh, that, and particularly those that are you know, impacted that can prove a hardship from COVID. Um, you know, I, I think depending on the jurisdictions, uh, there is more or less rigorous um, you know proof needed of that uh, to the chagrin of of many landlords, and. And I think what's what's happened is, you know, this look when, when this all happened, you know, first it was like, okay, is everyone going to pay rent? And most people did. And then, you know, that was April. Then we got to May, and you know, is this rent apocalypse going to happen? You know, it didn't, um, by and large. You know, certainly with exceptions. Um, but you know, there's still the protections that have been put in place. You know, as this has continue to extend. I think, you know, back if when this happened in March, you know, we're thinking, okay, how long can realistically the parties go on like this? Uh, how can the world go on a couple of weeks, a month? And we're nine months later still talking virtually, nobody's back in the office. Um, and, you know, things aren't too terrible uh, by and large uh, in, in terms of investments. Obviously a lot of terrible things happening. Um, but I think what, what we've seen from a legal standpoint is that you know, these moratoriums just continue to be extended. Um, so, which means that you know, a lot of these tenants that have stopped paying, they're able to say uh, they're not relieved of rent. So the restrictions generally, with a few exceptions, have not uh, allowed for abatement or um, cancellation of rent and there's been you know the cancel rent movement has made some noise but I don't think is you know seems to be um, you know gaining any serious momentum um, and you know there's the at the end of whenever the, this rollover you know finishes whenever the extensions end there's going to be large uh, payments due and then evictions can start will they happen you know, we'll see eventually um, you know, we would expect to see some serious distress um, coming into the market and particularly in, in the loans because what happens then is the lenders um, have been understanding. Uh, no, again, it's not the landlord's fault. And, you know, there's, there's been um, agreements to extend loans to, you know, to have some forbearance and you're generally tracking, but, but not officially. So those regulations officially have been in favor of tenants, landlords have been you know, doing the best they can. A little bit of property with tax relief um, as well, but um, that's kind of where we still are at nine months later. Yeah, well, it's it's interesting. You, you brought up uh, you know lenders, obviously, and and uh, the fact that people did continue to pay rent in in May and in June and. Um, you know, that coupled with interest rates dropping to sub three percent, you know, sometimes mid twos uh, really fueled um, a, a drive for a refinancings, but but uh, acquisitions and a lot of appetite for private capital to get back into the multifamily market. Uh, it seemed like there was a lull there for maybe four or five weeks. And, and all of a sudden it just kind of ramped things ramped back up to pre COVID pricing and um, I, I guess I'll just put it out to everyone on the panel, whoever wants to comment, but, you know, obviously interest rates are, are, are great right now. They're still very low. Um, you know, what do you think as the market recovers, uh, sort of forecasting where rates might be heading this year? I can take that um, first since, you know, we're kind of in the sure. crust of, of, you know, yeah. planning 2021 and seeing what, you know, I think, you know, looking at 2020, it's exactly as you said, you know, we expected the worst, it didn't happen. So we're, you know, very happy about that. Um, we were able to, you know, keep our interest rates pretty, pretty flat. I mean, they were already low, so we kind we kept them low. Um, 
and you know, kind of tried to pay attention to our existing portfolio and our existing clients and try to be responsive with deferral programs and everything we could do, you know, to assist them through this, you know, the hardship that we thought would, you know, last three or four months. Um, you know, nine months later, I'm happy to say that, you know, our, all of our deferrals were paid back, you know, our customers, you know, not kind of would seem to be, you know, weathering the storm, I think, you know, combination of, of, um, you know, the $600, the, you know, unemployment, like a, a, a lot of things that happened early on helped support that along the way. And even when that fell off and the 600 ended, we thought, you know, we'd see a bump on the road, but we really haven't. So again, we're optimistic, as I said, initially, and you'll hear that tone, that, that, you know, kind of thought process along the way for us um, is that we're, we're still waiting. Um, for something. But as far as interest rates are concerned, I think that that's kind of the, you know, um, a contributor to, you know, things going, you know, fairly stable for the most part is that I think um, interest rates will remain the same or, or go lower actually is what we're thinking. Um, the competitive market did spike up throughout the year for us. You know, we saw um, a lot more activity than we thought we would see when this started in March. Um, we saw a lot of purchases, so there's still, you know, investors out there looking for properties. I think we saw in, um, you know, landowners that were nervous and maybe had had properties for 20 or 25 years that said, you know, it's time for me to get out. I've already been through, you know, one too many downturns in real estate and I'm mm -hmm. just going to sell. Um, prices still held their, you know, held their own. So I think they, you know, that's what, you know, a, that's what kind of, you know, created some of the momentum on the sales and purchases. Um, so we saw a lot of activity on that end. And then with the interest rate environment being low, people also, you know, existing investors looked at their properties and said, hey, I can save some money, take advantage, lock in, you know, a low rate for, you know, five, seven, 15 years. So, um, so again, we saw the activity. We anticipate that in 2021, we will continue to see the activity. We did see a lot of, um, uh, you know, competition on the, from other banks that, you know, are looking for, especially for the strong deals. Everybody was looking for strong deals this year. I think that will continue in 2021. And I think that will cause um, pricing to, you know, tighten up a little bit more and, and, and be beneficial for the investor in the long run for the year. Yeah. And um, I, I completely agree with that. I obviously the, the uh, occupant, the uh, investment market, as I mentioned before, it seemed like there was a bit of a lull for, well, people kind of caught their breaths and and uh, and it's just been really strong over the last six months with uh, more and more private capital wanting to get into the market. Uh, John, you were about to say something it looked like. Yeah, you know, again, I, I agree with the rates staying low, but if it did go up to, you know, a whopping four or 5% uh, rates are historically, and those are still mm -hmm. very, very historically low rates. Um, but, I, but I agree with Vicki. Um, and, and everyone on the panel. Um, and there has to be that, that difference um, from an investor standpoint, buying in the cap rate uh, and their interest rate. So that return in their interest rate, that gap, that difference, you know, there needs to be an, a, a, a decent amount of, uh, of level of comfort to mitigate, you know, any unforeseen risk or disruption in, in the markets again, in the, in, the, in the property with renters, et cetera. But one of the things from an investment and really a forward look for, for that private capital and even public capital getting into uh, multifamily and that demand is, um, you know, rents kind of, you know, stayed level. In some cases, owners, uh, you know, had strategies of, of dropping rents to increase their, their occupancies. But mm -hmm. when rents and occupancies come back with locked in low interest rates, OK, uh, and again, that that you could argue across all property types, but especially on, on multifamily, um, that's just going to help when the rates do increase. Um, you know, you can offset that with with the higher income that is being generated from the rents. Got to keep our eye on the uh, real estate taxes and how we're underwriting those on a forward look basis uh, here in Chicago. But all in all, I think rates are going to still be low. But even if they go up, um, I still think there's that gap there's going to be some some really good opportunities out there. Yeah, I've, I've always tell, told people at the beginning of this that, uh, you know, if, if multifamily wasn't the darling child of the industry uh, before, it's certainly going to be going forward. And I think that's uh, proving out uh, based on sure. investor demand and also uh, 
you know, what's happening in the office market and retail market. Oh, good. I agree. Uh, not so much on the industrial market, but just everywhere else. But um, how do you guys foresee uh, demand yeah, guess, for, guess, for multifamily? Um, I guess Mark, I'm going to send his. Oh. I think that um, multifamily demand oh, really? is okay. still the strongest okay. sector right now that we're okay, hearing, excellent. you know, across, you know, any any panels or, you know. Um, yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. Hold yeah. yeah. oh, yeah. on a second, Vicki. I'm hearing oh, like somebody. Good. I'm just, you guys uh, hear the other voice? In, yeah. so I'll keep the guy I think it's coming from the second Vicki O'Reilly. Sorry, Vicki, you right. have a clone Thank that's you. also speaking at the same time. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Vicki. Oh, I didn't know I had a clone. That's weird. I'm only signed on to my phone. Sorry. No, it that. wasn't you. It was some. It was somebody else. It was a. It was oh. a man's voice. But go ahead. Okay. That's that's the beauty of this uh, techno technological yes. world that we're living in. So um, no, ahead. but I I do think that you know um, as we were talking about what's happened you know on, on whether it's vacancies occupancies you know we, we've been through real estate cycles you know the the housing market has been impacted before I think right now the housing market hasn't you know been shattered which is great so that hopefully speaks to the strength that we had going into it um, but I do think that. Um, from everywhere that, you know, we hear both on the lending side, on the capital market side with our capital market partners and lenders, um, multifamily is what everybody's looking for. So um, I, I do expect that that segment will remain strong, both for investors, um, for existing, um, you know, for new potential buyers that are looking into that marketplace and, you know, and, and hopefully enough to, um, to continue to keep us busy this year. But I, I do think that that will still, you know, unless something, again, that shoe drops and it's always out there, you know, kind of in the back of everybody's head, but I think that that will continue to be, there will be continue be, to be a demand, especially in outside, you know, of the Chicagoland markets. We see a lot of growth in um, South Carolina and Texas. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, you know, if you're a national, you know, if, if investors are, you know, looking not only locally in Chicago, cause you know, we have, tax issues and things like that, that people, you know, have scared away some investors. I think that new markets are also, um, you know, a potential, um, you know, potential um, spot that people will continue to be interested in. Well, taxes are always uh, an interesting uh, aspect of underwriting deals in the Chicago market. Um, so for sure, uh, going forward, I mean, and, you know, as rents started starting to get back to a higher level, I, I mean, one of the things that sort of uh, is talked about all the time is the, is the lack of uh, affordable housing or workforce housing uh, in the city and, and the suburbs for that matter as, as projects get uh, renovated or, or you know rents move up or um, you know everything that's built these days seems like it's uh, you know double class A whether it's suburbs or, or downtown. Um, how do you guys foresee uh the obviously it's going to be strong demand for affordable housing but the availability and uh, supply of of new affordable housing and when i say affordable housing i'm i'm lumping in workforce housing into that not necessarily um project based section 8 deals but just uh you know the projects that are frankly just more affordable for uh the working class uh population so how do you guys foresee that going forward? Um, I'll, I'll take it um, with, with some of the, the developers and developments and, and obviously talking to uh, aldermen, older women, the, the building and zoning. Um, there is a, a high demand for the requirements of affordable housing. Um, so it's it's in every project. It's in every discussion that, that we've been involved with, with uh, our buyer developers. Um, but in addition to that, in talking to the governing people and bodies, um, it's it's not only affordable housing, but there's also a parking uh, demand out there because we're bringing mm -hmm. more units uh, to to a market or a neighborhood, um, and that's a good thing because we have more people that are going to spend tax dollars and and buy things and and support the neighborhood. Sure. Um, you know, in some of these markets, there, there definitely is a need for parking. So, so we've seen that kind of going back and forth where uh, developers are offering more of one or the other in exchange for one or the other. Okay. And obviously developers are, are wanting to, to, to develop and create more units uh, for a number of different reasons for cost of developing um, their profit, uh, uh, making a, a neighborhood or market better. Um, but it's not just the, the aldermen and women, it's not just the building and zoning, it's community groups that are out there. 
that are outside of those governing bodies that are part of that neighborhood. But really, when you look at um, affordable housing, it's, it's kind of had a stigma over the years since I've been in business, um, but it's really getting an understanding of the benefit that that can have to a neighborhood, to landlords and other tenants in a, in a building. OK, and again, depending on sub markets, I understand. Mm -hmm. That, that might be a, a different uh, deal, but we have a couple of listings right now that have, um, in one, a very major uh, amount of affordable housing. And in looking at the, uh, the contracts with these agencies that are supporting the rents, we have uh, studios in this uh, one unit, predominantly studios, um, that are roughly around 400, 400 square feet. And the rent is over $2 and 62 cents a foot. Okay. For affordable. Okay. Mm -hmm. And historically, you know, your, your, um, your uh, studios are, are higher rent per square foot, but affordable at 260, it's over a thousand dollars a month. So, and, and these clauses have a forward look as well, where yeah. they're saying, Hey, let's look at market rents that market rate rents over the next year, two, three, four, five years. Now there's, there's clauses in there that, um, and, and they have inspections and, and appraisals uh, where these groups come out. So, you know, when we look at investors that want to increase or, or add value to the units, but they keep saying, well, I can't do it because I'm gonna have a ceiling on my affordable rents. Um, I, I think these programs are around and, and they're going to stay because uh, they're, they're just a huge requirement. And, it, and it's not, you know, it's 10% in some markets, it's 15% in other markets. But really, you look at from a rental side, uh, it's good cash flow. And, and, mm -hmm. and buyers, buyers are asking, when we have a, a listing, they're saying, tell us what the rent collections were during the pandemic. And on these right. properties where majority of it was affordable housing, it's 100%. So, <laughs> yeah. so these, 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 these are good opportunities and it's really just kind of changing uh, somewhat of a mindset of, of that affordable uh, component and what it does on the positive side. Right. Hey, uh, I, I don't know how long we have. I, I know we were talking. So I, I think we have a couple more minutes and I, I will let uh, sort of everyone on the panel just take a, a minute or two um, just to talk about uh, what they see going forward uh, for 2021, any well wishes, whatever you want to say for the next couple of minutes. Uh, Josh, why don't we start with you? And, and uh, as we wrap up here, I was hoping I'm looking on our chat side and it doesn't look like we have any direct questions. So we'll just end with, with that. Um, uh, go ahead, Josh. So, so last year, um, I think it was right around March 1st, uh, the, and COVID was just starting to take off. And I was speaking on one of these same panels that at uh, Real Estate Journal's multifamily conference last year. And last question was, and, and you know, it was not yet. We weren't shut down, obviously. We're still in a, in a big room, but there were some, you know, comments about hand sanitizer and things. Um, and so once we got to this point, the last question was, you know, this for 2020, is it, um, you know, do you see transaction volume uh, being up, down, or flat? And everyone on the panel was set up. And I said, well, I don't know. Uh, I'll, I'll say flat because I do think this virus is going to have some impact. Um, so, and I was the only one, but it, um, you know, turned out it, it looked like it was going to be a lot worse um, from, a, from a deal standpoint. Um, you know, and certainly when it, when it happened, uh, our clients were, um, you know, not looking to pull the trigger on, on deals until things felt uh, safer. Uh, but I think there's been, um, as, as we learn more, certainly been um, a, a bit of a rush to get back into market, put uh, capital to work, and a lot of interest in the multifamily space uh, on the long-term development side as well. And so I, I do think what will, I, th I think there's a link between, you know, the, when we come back into offices and, and when, you know, the multi, the downtown multifamily uh, sector will really start moving again. And so I think yeah. that's the, the big question mark is when will that happen? When will work from home, uh, you know, transition back to the office if ever. And so I think that ties into a lot of pertinent questions, but, um, you know, that's, Thing to watch. Okay, right. thanks. 
Whoever wants to go next, uh, jump in. Yeah, so I, I, I'd say, you know, um, <clears throat> I kind of look at the market through an operator uh, more than Mets, maybe on the investment side. But I, I want to tie on to something that John's, John said and, and more towards kind of getting back to the affordable. Affordable is here to stay. And, and as John said, whether it's a 10%, 15% ARO, whatever that, you know, that local body legislates, um, you know, it's, it's here to stay. So, so from an operator standpoint, um, there's two ways to look at it. One, it is guaranteed money, right? So when you look at rent collection, 100% rent collection, it's a great area to be in. Um, the other thing to look at is, is an operation side. Uh, how do you operate your properties in a, in a more streamlined fashion? Um, COVID's here, right? Um, who knows when it's going to go away? Uh, who knows when, you know, we'll get back to the old norm. Um, so all we can really look at from a forecast predictability standpoint is where were we yesterday? And let's assume there's not going to be much great change. So how do we, how do we work with what we already know? Um, and, and so the key is how do we take what we have and, and operate our properties in a more streamlined manner? And there's a lot of things we can do. Um, you know, through, you know, technologies and, um, you know, things of that nature. So, you know, my, my kind of takeaway that I hope to, you know, to kind of part on everybody is, is look at what you have today. Look at your operational expenses for your property and think of creative ways that you can, um, you know, maybe streamline some of those expenses. Um, talk to people in the market, talk to different technology companies, look at all of the different, you know, go down your role of all of your, your vendors and have conversations with them on, on what's new in their industry and how can they help you to operate more, more lean. Um, and you will be surprised of, of really some of the, the, the cool things that are out there today that can give you a better uh, experience in often cases um, and also potentially lower your total cost of ownership. So uh, take the, 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 the due diligence, do the legwork, talk to your vendors and, and see what they can do to help. And thank, thanks, uh, Michael. Um, I, I always love to come away from these things with uh, learning something new and, and uh, that technology that you were talking about, about tracking people as they're like walking around property, the property is, uh, is very interesting. A little scary, but very interesting. Uh, so, uh, I don't know, Vicky or John. Yeah, no, it's good. Um, Vicky or John. Yeah. I, I, um, I can just say that, you know, I think that, um, you know, last thoughts on 2020 are that I'm hopeful and, you know, also, you know, kind of teetering, uh, you know, going off the tangent of affordable housing. I think that it is here to stay. I think that that definition is going to broaden as 2021. And as you know, it, it's related, you know, if you think about it, multifamily in and of itself translates to families, individuals, you know, people. And as jobs are affected, you know, as people lose jobs in, you know, whatever industry, um, affordable housing could be a nurse or a teacher in our neighborhood, you know, and I think that, you um, that I've been encouraged to see companies like Amazon that just, you know, contributed, you know, I think it was like $2 billion to affordable housing. So I feel like though there will be new initiatives that will be launched to help support housing throughout, you know, our country and, um, you know, both private public partnerships, I feel that will, you know, continue to evolve and, um, and that, you know, I, I think that will help, you know, any, you know, any, if any shoe does fall down the line and so forth, hopefully we've gone through the worst of, you know, what we were going to see and, um, and there'll, there'll be just stabilization or improvement, of, you know, throughout 2021. Great, thanks. Yeah, and uh, Ralph, out of, uh, obviously out of crisis comes change. And um, I think everyone that, that has gone through this in our business is, is gonna be better off. Um, stronger, whatever it is you do. But to, to talk about operations moving forward with Michael, um, we had a listing uh, in Lincoln Park and in talking to the owner about his property, um, I asked him, do you have you know a security system? And he laughed at me, he said, come on, John, it's, it's Lincoln Park. And I said, okay. And then during the pandemic, he called me and he said, hey, we got broken into, do you have any uh, security? Uh, so I forwarded uh, Michael's company 
uh, Castle, uh, Charles in, in your office, Michael, and uh, he met with them. Okay. And, and again, that that's just, you know, it, it's, it's a change. Sure. So, you know, operators need to look at that and should look at that because it will create uh, that sense of family, like Vicki said, that I'm going to live here, I'm going to be and I'm going to keep paying the rent. So, um, you know, still have some bumps in the road, but um, all in all, I, I, I think it's, uh, it's positive. Well, that's great. And um, yeah, I, I appreciate uh, everyone on, on the panel, certainly. Thank you very much. Um, everyone, all the attendees, uh, I think we have about still 50, 50 or so, 40 left uh, that are still listening to us. So wanted to, we'll, wish uh, everyone well for a better 2021 i think it it can't be it can't be worse certainly hopefully not not what knock on wood but uh from uh from that perspective and a he healthy happy uh 2021 and uh thank you very much for participating uh hopefully the next one that we do of these will be in that big hotel and with uh you know coffee and snacks and all the other fun stuff that go with it so uh we'll talk soon thank you very much everyone Thank, Thank you. you Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Have a rest of your day.